broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome to the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. And yeah, I'm your host, Ben. And I'm your co-host, Carissa. There we go. And that may be a surprise sentence to our correspondent here. Uh, Today on the program, we have the one, the only Mr. Scott Schober. He is our cybersecurity expert. First time that Chris is going to be meeting him. But if you are a longtime listener of the show, then hey, this should be no surprise to you. So he is our cybersecurity expert. And if you can take a guess at what we're going to talk about, yeah. It's going to be cybersecurity. Lots of different articles, lots of different stories, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And really looking forward to it. But uh, just real quick, ComputerAmerica.com, past shows, future shows, archives, podcasts, uh, live video stream, all that and more at ComputerAmerica.com. Find it there. Also, social media at ComputerAmerica. And yeah, uh, just going to try to keep it quick because I think we have a lot to talk about today. And again, I'm really looking forward to it. So, uh, Carissa, unless you had anything to announce, then I think we're good to go. Oh, I'm ready to go. All right, perfect. So, as I said before, today's guest, Scott Schober, he is our cybersecurity expert. And, yeah, he's here to break down current events as well as talk about what he does because, you know, he does this for a living. This is his day job. He is not only a consultant for us, but he is also uh, making hardware and, yeah, you know, giving speeches. Although, obviously, a lot of the venues have been shut down because of uh, obvious events. But, you know, he's able to join us every single month and we love it. So, Scott, welcome back on to Computer America. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great, great to be back here. Look yeah, forward to our, chatting with you. Our pleasure, our pleasure. You're looking, looking sharp. I, I definitely like it. You always have the best studio of any of our correspondents. And hey, I gotta say, um, how you doing? So, so what have you been up to in the last month? D- doing good. Keeping very, very busy. Our, our business has certainly picked up. It's been a little crazy. I think there's a lot of government spending. So. For uh, until October 1st, we're going to be going full steam ahead, which is great in the world of cybersecurity and wireless the threat detection tools. The demand is high. Um, I haven't been doing speaking, as you mentioned there, as far as physically traveling, but I've been doing some virtual conferences, which is kind of fun, a little bit different, speaking in front of a, a camera as I'm talking to you now here, but doing that virtually. And, and it, some of the shows have opened up to different parts of the world, Africa, Indonesia, lots of different areas that normally I probably wouldn't have the time or effort to travel to. Now I can do it virtually. So some things are uh, kind of exciting and from that front. Makes sense, makes sense. And I gotta say real quick, obviously since you were last on, I got myself a co-host. Uh, Scott, hey, Carissa, yes. Carissa, Scott. Hi Scott, how's it going? Yeah, good. Doing good, doing good. Pleasure to meet you there and uh, you. look forward to your, uh, your, your questions and getting to know you a little bit better and uh, Certainly enjoy this format, and I've had the privilege of being on for, for a number of years now, and Ben's been fabulous, so Excellent. congratulations yeah. and welcome to uh, joining there. That, that that is that is the password for anyone who who wants to stay on computer america they have to call me fabulous at all points so and, and, and by the way i just gotta say love the shirt uh that is obviously the cover art for your hacked again book uh yeah. in short form i saw that yeah i would stand up awesome <laughs> spotted that very easily so there you go and everyone um, of course scott schober hacked again and then uh cyber security is everybody's business and then on top of that uh yeah i i figured that we would uh you know, kind of talk about this first because, uh, you know, this kind of goes along with what you've been up to, Scott. And uh, I'll I'll ask you, is it okay to show the image that you, uh, you know, sent over to me? And if we could, you know, talk a little bit about your new venture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Following the heels of cybersecurity is everybody's business. uh, Began writing right away on a new topic called senior cyber. And I'm kind of excited about this. And we talk a lot about hacks and breaches and scams and things over Mm -hmm. the past few years. Hasn't let up. 
But one common thread that I see again and again and again, and to me it's personally very frustrating, is when cyber criminals are targeting the elderly, those that are senior, and they, they prey on their innocence, they prey sometimes because perhaps they're a little bit more naive, and in some, time, some cases they may not be as tech savvy. And I'm not saying that to be critical toward anybody that is senior or elderly, it's just statistically true that that's, that's where they go. They're trying to get the low-hung fruit and capitalize wherever they can. And they really don't care. If, if you have wealth, if you have money, if they can uh, fool you out of it, they will do it. It's not necessarily something personal. So uh, what I've tried to do here, and, I, and I've co-written this with my brother Craig Schober, who's out on, on the uh, West Coast, out of mm-hmm. our LAO offices, and he helped me through this process also. So it's kind of interesting to, to bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, and we took about six months or so. Here, here's a, a, a first copy kind of thing of Senior Cyber, but you could see it up on the screen. So it's kind of a, an, an exciting light read. It's not deep tech dive. As a, an unfamiliar term comes up in, in Senior Cyber, I stop, I define it. There's, there's little uh, quizzes at the end of each thing just to make sure that you remember. So there's some standout highlights in the book as well. Um, and I think that's important. So seniors can look at it, read it, and have a takeaway. They can be empowered to use computers, to use the internet, and not be afraid of cyber criminals. And that's really the end goal there. It's an education and an encouragement at the same time. And uh, I, I see through my parents' eyes some of the struggles they have with technology and, and scams that they face through my, my grandfather. He's been, been hacked several times and before he passed. So I share some of those personal stories in here. And uh, hopefully it'll, it'll resonate with a lot of people that are, are elderly and kind of hesitant to use technology. And at the same time, if you have a parent or parents that are getting older, it can help you as a child to, to encourage them to not be so fearful and at the same time help them learn some best practices to stay safe, so that, that that's kind of the uh, the short plug for it. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely an important topic, and especially for um, in, in, an interesting topic for our uh, you know uh, our generation, especially uh, mining you know uh, people mining Chris's age, because our parents you know we kind of came of age with the internet available to us. And our parents were the ones telling us, you know, don't, you know, don't talk to the strangers, don't believe everything that you read on the internet, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure, Carissa, <laughs> that you them. got, oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> the joke's on them. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and that's the thing, is, is that, you know, the, you know, the parents that taught us to be skeptical of the internet, uh, now they're turning around and they're falling for internet uh, scams and whatnot at a much higher rate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you did, you know, you and uh, you and Craig did your research on the statistics, and it's just unfortunate that, you know, it's much higher the older you get. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really sad. And uh, e- even to the point where there's been some assisted living facilities where they'll get rosters of all the residents there and really? they will actually go through and target each and every person within that facility. It's that scary. Uh, that That's discouraging to me. Yeah. It's, it's not right. It's not fair. It's real, though. So I think yeah. we need to do is do everything we can to fight back and, and arm ourselves with knowledge and education and, and be willing to share that so seniors are in hopefully empowered so they don't have to be afraid and they can really enjoy the internet, enjoy technology and use it to, to the good that it does bring people. There's a lot of good that can come from it. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, feel free to send it over a copy and hey, you know, we love to, uh, to write something about it. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. You guys will get an advanced copy as soon as it uh, hits the presses. It's coming out soon. So looking keep forward you posted. to it. Absolutely. So there's that. And hey, uh, so there, uh, that will be coming out in a little bit. Like you said, it'll be printed soon. And obviously, hey, you know, scotchtrooper.com. So, okay, got that, uh, you know, got that covered. And you are very prolific on books. I've been meaning to write a book. Uh, man, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't know how much you and Craig kind of help each other to write these things, but it seems like such a daunting task to sit down and like pen a topic and really deep dive and, you know, hundreds of pages. It's very daunting. So I'm, I'm always impressed when you whenever you come out with a new novel yeah it it can be a a little bit overwhelming i always tell people if you could focus in on if you have a good story 
and you just start. And, and I, I, I may have mentioned before, one thing that's really helped me is I, I use speech to text. I stink at typing. I spell everything <laughs> wrong. I'm just not that good at it. But when, you, uh, when you're thinking about something and you speak it, you can actually do it much faster, not be tied up with all the little nuances of, did I spell that, that word right? Is I before E except after E? And all right. the, your, your mind gets very distracted. But when we just speak like this, we can actually express ourselves or even better, we can tell a story with feeling. And next thing you know, you look down at the written page and say, wow, I just spoke eight pages typed. Pretty amazing. Hmm. That's how you can formulate a book very quickly. And I really focused in on this. Um, and again, about six months or so, just talking, telling stories. And obviously to, to tell a story, it helps to do a lot of the research up ahead. So reading articles, doing research, taking notes, doing your homework up ahead, then you have the story formulating in your mind. And then the other magic formula that I think works well, and I'm going to recommend this for you too, Ben, mm -hmm. is if you have a sibling, that'd be a great co-op. Here you go. You could write a book. You could talk about the history of computer America. It's an exciting story. I only know little bits and pieces of it between you and from 20, your father. 29, but, almost 30 years on the air. It's uh, not yeah. many people can claim that. So, No, that, that really is something meant for the history books. And you can tell a story about that and share some funny stories and crazy experiences with guests and I should, tech probably, do that. I should probably do that regardless uh, you know craig craig yeah. is still here and you know is, is still kicking so that would be uh you know that would be an interesting uh take i'd never even considered that so yeah. scott your head is full of good ideas and i want to explore some of the other good ideas about some of the stories that we have so we're going to transition not so smoothly into topics of the day which uh, you know if, if you don't mind yeah let's dive right in perfect and uh yeah so you sent over a bunch of topics and uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, computeramerica.com will have links to all that including the book the website and all that good stuff but we'll also have a link to every article that we discuss here and i picked out a couple carissa picked out a couple and of course you sent over a couple and we're just gonna have fun with this i think that the first thing that we're going to do and i wanted your opinion and of course chris i want your opinion on this too uh this isn't so much data security or anything hacking or anything like that i don't know ladies and gentlemen if you know that there are limitations that uh, u.s customs and border patrol in particular but many government agencies have about collecting data where they get it from and uh you know how long they keep it where do they keep it like there's bunch of regulation when it comes to government agencies collecting data on potentially U.S. citizens and potentially not U.S. citizens. So what they decided to do was that there are tons of advertising agencies, and Scott, you can speak to this, but data is very prolific. Like, like, and I should say that there's a lot of data out there. Like a lot of things collect your data and it's up for sale. So Scott, I wanted you to react to the fact that U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, because they couldn't collect it on their own legally, they went out and paid the advertiser rate or the, uh, you know, whoever actually uses the data and they paid their 487,000 yearly subscription and they get access to way more data than they could ever collect on their own. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, data is extremely valuable these days. And we've talked more in the past about data breaches. But from the standpoint of monetizing data, every time you go into your browser, be it whatever it is, and you type in there, there's over 20 companies that are in line to pay for what you just typed in there. That's scary. You go to a search engine, same thing, true. And, and again, these are fractions of pennies, but when you add up millions upon millions of searches that are being done every day globally, that turns into billions of billions of dollars that are being paid. And why? Because you can harness that data, that big data, and really steer people toward what they like and what their spending habits are and push coupons, incentives, and pop it up on all our different, you know, our smart TV, our smartphone, our laptop, our iPad, 
wherever we are, to, whatever we're doing, soon in our car. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to give you some ideas, Scott, as to specifically what data they've been uh, you know, sharing with border protection, they said that the company uh, Ventel, who sold them access to the data, uh, collects it from apps such as games, weather apps, e-commerce, so think of like mm -hmm. uh, eBay or Amazon or something like that, as well as database of cell phone movements of, uh, I'm sorry, and then uh, games weather e-commerce and then sells it to government agencies that's what the wall street yeah. journal reported so those apps are and imagine all the data that's generated by weather apps alone let alone games and e-commerce oh yeah and, and it's tons of data and it can be used in so many more ways than at least i ever thought and that's the part that i guess starts to become very compelling um, I, I looked at, uh, at one company, I was at a trade show and I'm walking by and it caught my eye and they had some data engines that they use coupled with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I walked over curious and said, can you tell me a little bit more about this? This was at a, a security show. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we have access to a database and it's basically license plate readers. And most of the license plate readers, the data comes from repo men. They're driving around with their tow trucks day in, day out, mostly through cities, and they're collecting a lot of data. And I, I kind of looked at that and I, I said, where, what do you do with this? Then where, where does it go? And they said, well, actually, the, the law enforcement agencies use this because now if they want to apprehend a felon, there's a warrant out for somebody's arrest. They can click a button and they know within X number of hours where that particular license plate last was. And I said, are you kidding? I said, so you could tell me where I've driven? He goes, sure. He goes, uh, let's do a test. He goes, give me one of your license plates. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I said, <laughs> OK. So I give him one of my license plates. And sure enough, I was presenting. And this was, I believe, two days before the event that I was at. And I happened to have some equipment that I was bringing in. I pulled in front of the event. I was running late. So I parked illegally right out by the curb on the main road. Mm. And I remember on the ground, there were a bunch of round yellow rocks or whatever. So it was a very distinguishing spot where I parked at the main entrance. And he hits the button after I give him my license plate. Sure enough, it pulls up the back end of my car. I see the rocks on the ground and I parked illegally. And I was scanned twice at that location, probably by either a police officer or a tow truck or both in hopes that they might want to tow my car. And I said to myself, geez, that's scary. And all the ancillary information was pulled up alongside that. Who owned the car, was registered to, how mm -hmm. old it was, the make, the model, so on. So what am I saying all this for? It shows you how powerful that data is. That data is for sale. And I didn't yeah. even know that anybody was surveilling me or knew about me parking there. Yet that information is out there each and every day. Breadcrumbs to put together a bigger picture. That's really what it's all about. Right. That bigger picture then, of course, can be linked back to your daily movements, where you work, where you live, uh, just, you know, relatives, friends, close acquaintances. Uh, Stop yeah, to get a cup of coffee, everything. Yes. Yeah. You, you definitely get a bigger picture. And then, Chris, I wanted your reaction to that, too, that, you know, all, all of this data is collected day to day, just like Scott said, and, you know, even behind, uh, you know, just random apps on your phone and things like that, but actually tracking physically. And it all happens almost automatically. Uh, I, I mean, um, as far as government agencies go, Carissa, I, I'm not sure what your opinion on that is, but that, you know, are you surprised by any of that? At this point in time, in this this alternate reality that we're living in, not really. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, this I, is the main reality, yeah. but yeah, I get you. Yeah, like it's just... I get that it gets collected and I understand why and I get what they're using it for. But this article in particular is kind of horrifying because it's specifically about customs and border protection, yeah. which leads me to believe that they're trying to be malicious against people that may have, you know, cell phones on them that are maybe crossing the border illegally. And maybe they're using that to, you know, maybe collect people that they think shouldn't be here right. as a result uh of it, because it's a lot of location data, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Scott, do, do you recall a story that we did a little while ago about um, the customs, I, I think it was the Border Patrol as well, who were talking about if you wanted to enter the country, you had to have your phone essentially downloaded in its entirety and searched, you know, whenever you wanted to cross the border. Um, I believe that was like about like a year ago. And, board, and yeah. like, of course, you know, then we talked about 
can they be trusted with that information and was it even legal thanks to the fourth amendment but do, do you recall that issue yeah absolutely and and i guess one could argue if it's to keep america secure then it should be legal but another person could say well absolutely not that's an invasion of privacy um what, what i often encourage people to do and again not for malicious intent or trying to do things illegally but shut your bluetooth and shut your wi-fi off when you're not using it because that can be effectively used to hunt somebody down your phone is constantly beaconing out and saying here i am looking to associate to an access point be it the wi-fi uh, the other thing is with cell phones especially at the border patrol one of our very large customers is u.s border patrol and they are buying our wolfhound pro which is a simply a cell phone detection unit mm -hmm. and that unit will actually scan and it will look for strong signals. And the way it typically works is they have scouts or coyotes, they call them, up in the hills along the border. And what they're doing is they're looking for when Border Patrol drives past and there's a clear spot. And it's all orchestrated through cell phones. And they'll say, it's clear, but they'll probably say it in Spanish right. or depending upon where they're at. Run through, you've got about two minutes so you can sneak across the other side or swim across the river or whatever the case may be. Um, therefore, cell phones are an integral part of illegal border crossings, and they're using tools so they can actually hunt people down. So some of their activities, it's a cat and mouse game, and law enforcement has a tough time because uh, the wall, the border is just too big. There's not enough manpower, there's not enough walls and dollars to prevent people from crossing back and forth. Is, so they're isn't using the border technology. like 1,700 miles? I, I think it's like yeah, 17, it's, it's ludicrous. Miles. It's huge. It's huge. It's, it's yeah, thousands of miles, and there's a lot of spots that are extremely difficult to just to drive along. So they'll use drones, they'll use airplanes, they'll use off-road vehicles, they'll use camera systems, and there's technology both on the wall and buried just to try to keep up, and they still can't do it. So I it am, tells you how much of a monumental task it is. I'm sure that you've had requests, especially for uh, drone detection as well, because uh, yeah. you know drones are being used a lot more on the border wall. So, yeah, yeah, yeah de definitely. And by the way, quick Google search: uh, 1,954 miles of uh, land that they have to, you know, uh, they have to monitor. So there you go. Makes perfect sense. And I just wanted, uh, you know, a quick reaction to that. Again, that the original story was about uh, border uh, border protection using apps and essentially bypassing government limitations or regulation on what they can collect and they just went out and paid the advertiser fee and just you know you got the data anyways just kind of went through one little hoop and uh yeah it it, it seemed like an interesting workaround but uh yeah i guess they were going to get the, the information one way or another so there's that story mm -hmm. story number two and this is going to come from some of the stories that you sent over um <laughs> We we touched on this, so we don't need to cover it in its entirety, but I do want your reaction to this. Uh, Carissa, if you recall on Monday, I think we talked about Tesla owners uh, essentially getting around a hack and then Tesla defeating yes. the hack. Yeah, yeah, the, we did that story on, on, uh, on Monday, but you bring it up again because obviously you weren't here on Monday, Scott. So let's talk about this. And by the way, spoiler alert, the company who put it or the organization who put out the first hack of the Tesla car said, give us two weeks and we'll get around it again. <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of this catches my eye just because, number one, love technology, love Tesla, love electric vehicles. I haven't crossed the point where I'm driving a Tesla yet. One day, hopefully I will. Um, but I find it fascinating. I've talked to a lot of owners of Teslas, and, and they, they seem to be enthusiasts that like the performance, they like the acceleration, they enjoy that aspect of it, and they're car aficionados oftentimes. So when I read this, it, it just caught my eye, and, and it crisscrosses the love of cars, but then also the love of cybersecurity slash hacking. And I think just, just the fact that they kind of pre-build cars and pre-load them with software that has capability that can be unlocked or unleashed later is very powerful. Um, and, and it goes to the point of a lot of IoT devices, the internet of things, how everything is interconnected. We too in our company have done this. We released some products last year and we just finished a major firmware release 
which provides about 20 key features to our customers. We send them a bootloader, it's inside the unit and a firmware upload capability that allows them to exploit all these new features because the core hardware is designed, it's the software or firmware that unleashes the power. And that's the same thing here. But the funny part is that, that the users get frustrated. So if you don't come out in time and get that firmware patch out, and we have the same problem. I've had a half dozen customers that are dying for the latest release. Mm -hmm. They hear rumor in the wind, what the feature said is they want it. Same thing true on, on a car, which is a heftier price tag on it. And they're saying, hey, I demand this feature, but they don't want to pay for it. Yeah. And here they try to get around and work around and find hacking uh, yeah. a means uh, of backdoor to, to get in, which is kind of funny. Yeah, to, to flesh that out a little bit more, uh, this is our understanding that Tesla saves money by uh, on production if they can build all the cars exactly the same. You know, there's not multiple production lines. There's not multiple uh, ways that they have to do this. So if they put all, let's say, Model 3s together the exact same, but then they artificially limit the battery range by 50 miles. They, you know, knock off some horsepower artificially. They, uh, you know, kind of limit the battery capacity or things like that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through the firmware. Then you pay more, you know, so that people pay, I guess, kind of like the full price. But if you don't pay for it, then more people can afford the car at like, let's say 35,000 as opposed to 44,000. So they get more people in Teslas, but not everyone can afford all the bells and whistles. So it's technically there, but software wise, it's limited. And this is what they're getting around. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to your point, oftentimes, and we see the same thing on a smaller scale, obviously, we're not putting out hundreds of thousands of cars as Tesla is but we're putting out hundreds of instruments we're building. And if you're gonna build even a even hundred instruments all the same, it's very efficient. Mm -hmm. If you have to build 50 this way and 50 that way, yeah. the inefficiencies crop up and now you've got different teams, different piles, different revs, it gets confusing. And more importantly, it becomes inefficient. So Tesla is really th their whole success, I think. And, and this really crosses Elon Musk's, I guess, methodology through multiple businesses is to mass produce things and, mm -hmm. and take the costs out so you can get people to adopt it. And I think he's really done some amazing stuff, especially in the in the in the space area, I think, yeah. with launching of satellites and other areas. I know it's a different topic, but that area I think they've got some really exciting stuff coming up because that's kind of the future of where communications is going, where the next generation of internet's going. And I think that's where we're gonna see some major changes and followed by some major hacks. Yeah, if, uh, well, uh, man, I had never considered uh, not only hacking a spaceship, but also hacking uh, a global internet network. That would also be bad. But um, I think you're right. And Tesla and Elon Musk definitely have a lot of innovation. But hey, they're a tech company and they're kind of adapting as we go along. And by the way, like I said before, the company said that they're going to work on a workaround. But I completely... I completely understand why Elon Musk and Tesla want to keep the uh, the car's software and firmware as, I guess, kind of uh, locked down as much as possible. Because, you know, hey, you don't want people tinkering with your finely tuned machine uh, for, safety or even, uh, for safety reasons, number one, and for monetary reasons, obviously, potentially number two. So, yeah. okay, there, there's that story. And by the way, just going from Elon Musk to Elon Musk, uh, this is a story that uh, Carissa pulled up. And let's see, I have it right here. This is from uh, IB Times. And man, he has some crazy hair. But this is about Neuralink. And I, we're not going to get into you know uh, the full Neuralink picture. For those who don't know, Neuralink is Elon Musk's ne next adventure. Because I guess he's a serial... He's addicted to starting new companies. That's kind of his thing. And uh, after space flight, after boring through the Earth, after cars and uh, satellite internet, he decided, you know what? We're going to make a more efficient way to talk to machines. Because just like with you know Scott in his books, uh, where he really enjoys talk, you know, speak, speech to text and that kind of thing, this is the next one. This is the next step further, where a computer would actually receive inputs depending on how you think and what you think. Uh, you know, so that you could think, oh, click on that link, and instead of moving your hand and click on the link, it would just kind of go to it. Or you think, uh, you know, recipe for 
whatever and the recipe would pop right up. So Neuralink is his idea of how to interface with machines going forward because he feels that the mouse and keyboard is just not the answer. So our point here, this article, Elon Musk says Tesla is developing neural network training computer for four full self-driving, which Again, uh, I said input for computers. The Tesla car is kind of like a computer. So you'll be able to mm -hmm. drive with your mind. Uh, your mind will wander and people will die. But that's not the point. <laughs> the The reason we kind of picked this up, Scott, was because we wanted your, uh, your take on the idea that Neuralink isn't just that one way. It isn't just, you know, people's brains to people's computers. I think he even said that the, the true end goal is that there would be a back and forth of information between computers and people's brains. Um, have you given any thought to what the end result of that could be, especially with what you know about cybersecurity and how technology is so, um, I don't know, uh, prone to abuse as it currently is? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally the idea to, is exciting to myself upon unpeeling the onion and looking a little deeper, it, it could be very dangerous. And, and I'm often thinking of it from a, a negative side or pessimistic or the hacking side. How can you exploit? What vulnerabilities are there there? Um, and, and how difficult it would be to patch those things and the damage that can occur. So when you look at it from that negative side, it's really scary. As you mentioned, if it's, if it's tied with cars, they're going to crash. If it's your brain and machine trying to do something else, it could be a catastrophe depending upon um, what's hacked from the outside or somebody else trying to mess with it. So it's certainly scary. It reminds me a little bit about um, some of the AI being used for some of these conversational um, digital assistants. And, and I think we've talked about that before, the Alexas of the world and things mm -hmm. like that. They're getting smarter and smarter, and they're talking, and now they've got the ability to do some self-learning. And, and that kind of borderlines what Elon Musk is doing there, I believe, where it's tapping into your brain and learning things on the fly and adapting. And I think the, the fundamental thing that you have to look at at the end of the day is, what's the base of all this? It's really humans. Humans are imperfect. So when you take something that fundamentally is imperfect, just because you speed it up, and can access all these things through artificial intelligence, machine learning, and adapt to it and change the course so it's not what you naturally think it would be, it still fundamentally is going to be imperfect. So it's going to inherit vulnerabilities, which could then be exploited. So great idea on paper. When it's implemented, it's got some really scary implications that I think will unfold. I, I almost hope that, uh, and I know that, that whoever has this job is not very is not very popular or is not publicized but i hope there's someone in his organization telling him you know that's not ready yet and uh you know i hope that they get paid a lot of money i gotta say that so uh, like you said this is on the goal to the level five self-driving car the self-driving car that will drive itself and you have literally no intervention he says himself that he drives the complete you know, the zero day alpha, you know, the bleeding edge, most new technology. And he says that he goes from home to work uh, every single day without ever touching the steering wheel, that his car drives him from one place to another. Very impressive. And I'm glad that he uses it himself. Um, I just hope that there's someone telling him that, you know, hey, this, you know, this isn't for everyone or for everywhere uh, to yeah. even that point. And you mentioned that the digital assistants, we recently put in some internet connected uh, garage door openers. Mm -hmm. And I found it very interesting that when I was trying to, you know, download the app and see what was going on, you can open and close them from within the app. But then when you try to connect them from third party, because they're only tied to IFTTT and mm -hmm. they restrict the ability to open the garage door to third party. So third party programs can't open garage doors that can only close them. I thought that was interesting. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting. It, it kind of reminds me, I was playing earlier with some of the wise cameras. I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and also the Wi-Fi switches that they have out now and outdoor cam. So when you look at all of those IOT things, they do open the door to a lot more capability in things. 
Uh, as far as the, 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 the bottom line with self-driving cars, for me personally, the concept I, I think is amazing. I still don't get it. Mm -hmm. I, I ask myself, I can ride a bike with no hands, but I can only do it for so long. Eventually it gets boring or I'm going to crash and get hurt. So I'm not going to always ride around with no hands. It's kind of like the same thing with a car. You're going to get in it. You're going to sit there and what, read a newspaper and drive to work or commute Technically, or go somewhere you're not else. allowed to do that you're not allowed to yeah. look away from the road uh you know by all accounts so far you have to sit there and do the exact same thing you were doing except your hands are in your lap and ready to grab the wheel instead of you know on the wheel so it's almost the same thing currently yeah yeah it's, it's kind of like analogous to maybe an airplane that has autopilot do any airplanes <laughs> take off, fly, and land 100% on autopilot. I don't think so. And I don't think you'd want it to because mm -hmm. you got to look at the cargo, the passengers. That's well, dangerous. It, the, the, the you could definitely see that, that although, you know, as a, as a technologist, Scott, you can admit that that's probably where it's going, though. You know, sure. when, it, when oh, it's I all said it and done. Is. Yeah. 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 Look, look at Uber. Look at Lyft. Their entire business model right now is doomed and it's going to fail if autonomous cars do not succeed. That, that to me is a scary business proposition. And then when you hear how many billions of dollars people are dumping into these companies that are still not profitable, <laughs> great business idea, but they don't make any money, that to me doesn't make a lot of sense when you're banking on someday there's gonna be autonomous cars to solve the problem. It's, so it's chasing the wrong way. And, and, and just to be clear, the problem with, uh, you know, kind of uh, gig economy, ride share and grocery delivery, all that kind of thing. Uh, the problem that you're speaking of is the fact that they have to classify their drivers as employees, uh, which which particular problem were, were you kind of speaking to just there? Yes, there's about 100 problems. It, it takes a <laughs> while. If you, if you go through just Uber alone, a lot more on the cybersecurity side, all their blunders and mistakes that they've made. There's a lot of shortcuts these we companies are going to are transition trying. to that, by the way, next. So yeah, it, and, and I think that that's part of the problem. But, but the way they classify drivers, big mistake. I've talked to probably a hundred Uber drivers. I use the service all the time. It's mm -hmm. great. It works. Um, it's affordable, and that's why I use it. Instead of getting into a smelly cab, you hop into a total stranger's Uber car, <laughs> and you get there cheaper. And a lot of people are going to go for convenience and savings of cost. And to me, I always talk to the drivers and I ask, what do you like about Uber? What do you hate about it? At the end of the conversation, everybody is an Uber driver for getting money on the side until they could land another job typically. Mm -hmm. And they all say the same thing. It was great when I started, they don't pay me enough. So I have to work longer hours, crazy hours. So it's, it's a very negative um, feedback that you get from from Uber drivers. I even I thought of a too. series coming up on it, just talking about all the stories, Uber stories that you hear from all the drivers and, and, and crazy things out there. But it, I think it's a failed business model unless autonomous cars come out because they're not paying the drivers enough. They're going to lose it and you yeah. can't keep good quality drivers and, and it's going to hurt them in the long run. Yeah, and, and that's where you see a lot of uh, Tesla's valuation, uh, if you've been watching stocks at all. But Tesla, they said that you know part of that is that they're building these electric cars, but then they're also coming out with uh, the ability for these cars to be self-driving and to be taxis in their own right. So when you're not using them, the car can be out there earning money, and that solves that entire industry that you were just talking about. Uh, there, there are a lot of problems, like you said, and... Hey, transitioning to Uber, ex Uber security head charged in connection with the cover up of a 2016 hack that affected 57 million customers. Scott, I'll let you run through what happened, but man, it took him four years to finally find a fall guy. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's typically happening with a lot of these breaches. They, they do cover it up. And I, I think that was from the transition from 2016 to 2017, where their CEO came in. And it was a mess. It was a cover up. And in fact, the breach, if you remember, they classified their breach uh, as a, uh, a bug fix, bug bounty, cover up, payoff. And I think it was $100,000, if I recall right, to hackers to basically like a ransom and said, hey, pay this off and we'll call it a, you know, a bug bounty fee. And we never won't be in the headlines. Never announced it to anyone. Never announced yeah. to anyone, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, the, the concept, I'll give them clever, it was great, poorly executed, a, as well as many other things that, that I think Uber has done poorly. Um, it, it just goes on a long laundry list of things they did wrong that eventually will catch up. And here you're talking about, geez, four plus years later, it catches up, but it was a true cover up. And, and what I don't like is if you really do a deep dive, and I did, a, I did one chapter in cybersecurity is everybody's business, shameless plug. Uh, just on Uber and the whole debacle of all these type of things that they've done, which tells me why their brand is not going to survive in the long run and, and why, why it does work for now because people can get cheap rides. The service is great. The concept is great, but it won't last in the long run because they've got fail, fail, fail again and again. They're, they're a very mismanaged company. I feel no threat from anyone for saying that because it's very apparent and i gotta say though that even though they're so mismanaged they have and and i'm talking about like you know especially this incident and a few things in the past they're so mismanaged though that they still have the majority of the market share when it comes to ride sharing they still have the majority when it comes to uh grocery delivery i think they're still doing pretty good restaurant and food delivery uh is still doing pretty good like even though they are you know, quite, they, they are the most common uh, one to be in the headlines for doing something wrong. And yet they are still, like you said, none of these companies are turning a profit, but they're the most not, they're the most or least non not profitable, I guess you could say. Uh, they're still doing the best of the worst. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. It depends where you're looking at. Maybe <laughs> it, it, I, I draw a parallel to Atari back in the days of the 80s. I followed them very closely. My dad worked there. There was a, a brand and a name and a following that every kid in America and, and around the world they felt was fast. playing uh, Atari games. What happened to them, though? If you really look at the, the bigger picture over time, they were taken over by really disgruntled employees that left and started up Activision and all these other companies. And then other technologies and other com- companies that competed from gaming systems built superior gaming systems and and they just fell behind. So sometimes if you're the first there to market, doesn't mean you're always going to last and be the best. You may be the biggest, like Uber is the biggest, clearly. Doesn't mean that they're going to last. I I always ask myself, what would happen if Tesla or Apple or Google bought Lyft? Overnight, you would see a transformation in the world of uh, driving the way it happens, especially with the introduction of uh, automated cars and, and, and driving shared services and all these other things would come up overnight. So I could see the field is going to change greatly in the future because the companies like Google and even Amazon and others, they've got departments that are really developing parallel technologies in this space uh, of autonomous cars that are going to transform the way that, that we do things. And I think another step too, not to get off topic too much, but they're doing the same thing at Tesla with trucks where they have one master truck and they've got three trucks behind it. They're really going up against the rail and that they're, they're claiming that this is going to be a game changer. Imagine four, you know, giant 18 wheelers hovering down the road that are really electrically equipped that are moving the same amount as maybe trains mm-hmm. and maybe you have one driver in the front to meet the legal requirements based upon the, the federal regulations. But now you can move a lot of freight very quickly and compete with rail. That That's a, a big change to, to the way things are done in this country, at least. The the you're you're talking about a modern day cowboy where you have one rancher yeah. and ten and ten thousand head of cattle except instead of cattle it's uh, ten thousand Tesla semis. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, Yahoo. It, it, yeah, it would be it would be very impressive, and it's definitely coming with a lot of these technologies. And like you said, uh, these companies are all competitors. You know, companies that you wouldn't think. How could you think that a search engine company would compete with the same company that sells you, uh, you know, cheap outlet covers from China, and the same company that does ride sharing? And of course, I'm talking about Google, Amazon, and uh, Uber. They're all competing directly with each other in self driving cars. So it's uh, and there's even some poaching going on. There's some uh, there's some nice espionage, a nice uh, underplot to the whole story. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got federal regulation now coming in affecting big tech. Who knows how that's going to play out? 
could, could be interesting. Yeah, uh, well, you know, I guess it just takes a couple people getting hit by these vehicles and yeah, you know, then the regulation starts coming in. But we'll definitely see how that develops. And and I think that the story again about Uber and the 2016 whole thing, we had great fun with that about two years after it happened, Scott, because we didn't hear about it until about two years after it happened. Like they said in the article, until the new CEO came in and, you know, kind of raised the alarm bell. So, yeah, um, good cover up. Yeah, maybe, maybe they'll get eight years, but we'll definitely have to wait and see. So, with that being said, um, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be a Scott Stoker show if we didn't talk about a data breach. And this seems to be the biggest one in recent memory. This one even slipped by us. So, let's talk about this. This article came out two days ago. And actually, we just, uh, we actually just, did an interview talking about TikTok, and I'm looking forward to being able to air that. But TikTok, we one of the main things that we talked about with with that company was how much data that it collects and all that good stuff. So a lot of data, Instagram, YouTube, huge names, and we're talking. I would not doubt about two to three billion accounts that they have. Not that they that were hacked, but this hack could have been a lot bigger if they had you know kind of gotten deeper but talk about this one this one from securitymagazine.com and yeah tiktok instagram and youtube what happened yeah i mean here as you mentioned it could have been a lot worse but i think it's 235 million users of tiktok instagram youtube that's a pretty big database and again it's personal identifiable information it's your traditional stuff. It's your name and other other things like that and records that tie it to somebody's personal account there. None of it in itself is ever that damaging, but when you start putting those things together where it, it associates, hey, this is Scott Schober, here's a picture of Scott, his name, maybe his email address, the description of him, what do you start thinking about instantly? You start thinking about identity theft. To me, this is... This information is golden to somebody putting together a case to compromise somebody's identity because it just, again, gets you one step closer and closer and closer. And since it's social media, it starts to tell you also about a person's likes and dislikes. So if you're going to socially engineer them, you know a lot about a person. You know a lot about the people that they hang out with, what they buy, where they grocery shop, uh, where they go on vacation. It it depends on how deep you want to go. But Mm -hmm. typically, guys that are really good at putting together a profile or a case for identity theft, do their homework and do the research. This is what they need, because this is a lot of information that they couple together, probably with other compromised databases, which makes it powerful. So, and, and of course, with uh, they said that this is coming from a now defunct company, Deep Social, and this reminds me of almost every Facebook hack that we've covered here on the program. It's like, you know, it wasn't even like a technology flaw that made this happen, or wasn't you know, uh, you know, most times it's, it's like some server uh, left without a password or something like that. But this was, you know, how how did this get out there? It looks like. Well, they sold it to someone and that company wasn't, uh, you know, uh, well, it's defunct. So they weren't, you know, being good with it anyways. But essentially, mm-hmm. it's like, how did all this data get out there? It's like, well, they put it out there. Like, it, nothing went wrong. Everything went right. Yeah. And I think part of the challenge fundamentally, and I have a lot of problems, especially with Facebook and Facebook's not alone. Other big tech companies are all doing this. They're monetizing on our data. But they're doing it sneakily because oftentimes it's through their third-party agreements. They give them permission to have access through this API, Mm -hmm. and they can collect data. And maybe it's something as mundane as your timeline and your friends on Facebook, so on and so forth. But that information starts to become very powerful when you put it together. Because who owns Instagram? Facebook. What happened to everybody 30 years and younger that was on Facebook years ago now has migrated to Instagram. So you got two of the largest social media platforms owned by Facebook. And now there's also, I guess, news headlines recently, I think as as recent as a week ago, that now they're going to be integrating Zoom features and other video conferencing onto these social media platforms. Again, many of these companies are 
outside of the United States or, or other questionable conducts been happening as far as their security and breaches that they themselves has, have had, now bring that into this full circle, you start to open up a lot of vulnerabilities because everybody has access to these APIs and third-party developers. To me, it's like a, a three-ring circus that gets out there in the cybersecurity world. And that to me is scary. It, it, it's not hard to get access to an API, and I think that the reason Facebook got in trouble for the 2016 election meddling was that, hey, you know, they let anyone with a credit card get into uh, their API and download that yeah. data and use it however they saw fit. And uh, it's gotten a little better since then, but obviously, you and I both know uh, a long way to go. So one thing I wanted to, you know, kind of uh, bridge one more topic, what we just talked about with your book that you just wrote about... Uh, you know, obviously seniors and, you know, data security and using computers and that kind of thing. Uh, this article grabbed my attention. We're not going to get too far into it, but Google's own engineers said that the company confuses users on privacy settings that are now the subject of a lawsuit in the state of Arizona. And hey, no, you know, no retirees there. Uh, the state of Arizona <laughs> is suing Google uh, on everyone's behalf because I guess the settings, they made it look like you could turn it off, but they, the way that they were worded, it was like, you shouldn't, yes, but yeah, no, yeah, but it is turned, but it is, is off. Like, it was just really confused. It confused even the engineers who were building it, the way that it was worded, and they said that they even uh, purposely did it so that people would leave their location data on as well as other things that Google uh, wanted slash needed to develop. Uh, I believe Arizona Mirror was, um, yeah, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, Arizona Mirror was the publication that first published this. But yeah, Google wanted the, uh, the data so that they could better, you know, make their products. And they said they even had an internal O beep moment i can't say that word on the air but yeah they purposely did it. so scott i wanted to bridge what you just said everything with you know the previous article about uh you know how much data we're we are really putting out there and then of course seniors you know not falling for this but then you have the companies actively work allegedly actively working against their users to make sure that they do leak that much information oh yeah and and, and there's where i have to say that big tech and big data, it, it's often the case and they're often at fault because they're, they're, they're really sneaky. It's not clear, and I always bring this point up when I'm presenting on cybersecurity topics, that if you take your smartphone, the average person usually has close to 50 different apps that they've downloaded on their phone. And yep. if you go to the, the, the privacy, the terms and conditions, the average person to read what they've downloaded on their phone would take them three months to read the terms and conditions that they agreed to right when they signed off on it to download it. Has anybody, I've never come across one person in my entire life that has actually read all the terms and conditions for all the apps they've downloaded on their phone, nor do they understand them or can they read the font on it because it's so small. And <laughs> most of that stuff is you are giving away, you're giving them carte blanche and saying, yes, you can, take the geotags of everything I do, my location data, my timestamp data. You can, in many cases, have access to my contacts. In some cases, um, you can have access to the last 10 things that I actually put up in my URL, the sites I visited or the search engine terms I put into my search engine. You're giving them access if they want that. Um, that to me is really scary. And, and one thing that you could do to just to check and see how dangerous it is, how much information is pushed out of your phone. Many smartphones now, every five seconds, they're pushing information out when you're actively using it. Why? Because all that data is being collected and sold to other people. So we're guilty of this by downloading all this stuff. So uh, a word of caution from the, the world of cybersecurity, if you haven't used a particular app in the last month, mm -hmm. consider deleting it, or at least going in there and shutting off all of the data location and other things that you're voluntarily giving away because it may come back and bite you someday it I, could yeah. but like i i nobody's read it in the history of ever and like <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna want to use these products anyway and i feel like people mine and ben's age we're just so used to just giving it out we're just like yep. whatever who cares 
you know. Well, that's and and, and yeah, sorry for, for cutting you off, but I just got to say that that's why I have this up on the screen here. Terms of service didn't read uh, TOSDR.org. It, you know, kind of breaks it down into little bullet points for, our, you know, a lot of the major websites. You can see it there yeah. and, you know, kind of what's good, what's not good. Uh, and then one other thing I wanted to say was I recall a story that they use so many boilerplates because it's so much legal jargon to write those terms of service. Uh, a, a majority of them actually have conflicts within their own terms of service that mean completely different things because they kind of copy and paste from multiple sources to make those terms of service. So uh, the companies who write them don't even read what they write. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a complete disaster, I think, from the legality side, I think, and how much we voluntarily give away each and every day. It, it's, it's very sad and how they take advantage of us. And the thought of actually having privacy is really non-existent anymore. For sure. Well, here's another one I was thinking about as well, you know, like out in the real world, regardless of the internet. But this one here, it says ATM hackers have picked up some clever new tricks. That's more of like a another risk for elderly people, you know, like going to these. Hey, ATM. I have money too, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so I think... I think that's a big one there, though, because there, there are a lot of elderly people that do have debit cards or withdraw cash, and that may, maybe they only draw, withdraw a certain amount each week. But especially now, with the pandemic, a lot of banking hours are not normal anymore. You can't go inside your bank, and many elderly people tend to go into a physical bank. They've had to learn to adopt to go to an ATM, and a lot of these ATM scams are just unbelievable because it's really manipulating the firmware inside of the ATM, be it remotely or physically or from factory in some of these cases where, where they could basically cash out and give you, as they call it, a jackpot and the thing just starts spewing out $20 bills. <laughs> it's become really popular in the world of hacking. They like to see who can get the most out of any machines and hack into them without getting caught. And uh, they're really taking a toll on the industry. And it's, it's got to it's gotta stop because people are going to lose their confidence going to a bank or an ATM anymore, the way it's happening. There was a breach. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this will be our last story for the day. This hour flew on by. Uh, yeah, but I, I recall that there was a massive heist in Europe that hit multiple countries at the exact same time uh, where I guess they were using like anything with a magnetic strip, they found a security breach that they could like imprint uh, a bank card with no limit. I don't even know why that was a thing, but they had a bank card with no limit and they hit like a ton of countries in Europe at the exact same time, stole tens of millions of dollars out of ATMs. And then they kind of like funneled the money uh, out of the country and hid it away. Like they were not able to get, get it back. Uh, that was the thing. And I guess that is an example of jackpotting, you know, like you said, being able to get yeah. all the money, all the physical money out of these things. Yeah. Or, or there was a simple, similar scam. And I think it originated in Australia before it became more widespread they learned certain ATM manufacturers, they called it forking. And you took a fork and you'd bend one of the prongs off on it. And you would basically put your debit card in and you would say, give me a hundred dollars. And you would listen carefully. And at the right time, you would jam your fork into the machine. And what it ended up doing is it would cause a malfunction in the hardware, which caused a reset, a hard reset to the machine. It, but you would do it right in time as the $100 bill came out, you jammed your fork in, it would reset it, and it would think it didn't dispense $100. When the machine booted back up, it would spit out another $100. And the thieves knew this. If you could do this very carefully, you could basically steal in $100 increments X number of dollars from a machine. Then they would run to the next ATM in town and the next, and they mapped them all out, bleeded the machines dry, and hence the term forking got very popular be before ATM manufacturers got the wiser and took that vulnerability out. So it never made that mistake and second dispensed and during that cycle. Who comes you know, up with these clever ideas? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, only, the only fork that we know here on the show is about Linux distributions and, you know, when things fork and that kind of thing. Very interesting. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, music in the background. Scott, if people want to find out more, where's the best place to go? 
They certainly go to my uh, company's website, bvsystems.com, or they can go to my personal website, scottshober.com, and learn more about events I'm speaking at, books, releases, blogs, and all the different things that I'm involved in. All right, perfect. And like I said, we'll have that in the show notes. Scott, another successful month. And I hope that, you know, uh, you said the business is picking up. I love to hear that. And hey, we hope to hear back from you at the end of next month. Yeah, look, look forward to it. And uh, thanks again for having me on and everybody out there. Stay safe. Absolutely. And Carissa, you're expected back tomorrow, though. He gets a month off. You are back on tomorrow. Oh, so, shucks. All right. I know. So everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.